Rio Grande was not just one of Ford and Wayne's memorable collaborations. It was also the first time Wayne worked on screen with Maureen O'Hara, and their chemistry was undeniable. Carrying that around for a long time, hoping someday to pull I'll a little... i the flowers now. My father was a major movie star, and I think that you have to kind of explode off the screen, you know, and, 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 and be larger than life. And I think Maureen was a woman that could match him on the screen. Aren't you going to kiss me goodbye? I never want to kiss you goodbye, Kathleen. And so something happened on the screen. There was, there was an electricity there. But she could match John Wayne uh, kiss for kiss, punch for punch, you know, stride for stride. When Rio Grande turned out well and promised to be a hit, Herb Yates gave the go-ahead for The Quiet Man. Richard Llewellyn, author of How Green Was My Valley, expanded Maurice Walsh's short story. And then Frank S. Nugent wrote the finished script. Nugent's screenplay opened with these words. Behind the title and the credits, there will be a series of shots in and around Galway, which the director knows like the back of his hand. The same back of the hand which this writer would get if he risked suggesting the shots. Right from the start, it was agreed that The Quiet Man would have to be filmed where it took place. And to Herb Yates' consternation, Ford insisted that it be shot in Technicolor. Yates owned a much cheaper process called True Color, which was anything but true. Ford would have none of that. Witt and C. Hope, who'd won an Oscar photographing She Wore a Yellow Ribbon in Technicolor, would again take his position behind the camera on location in the Emerald Isle. Now, it might seem obvious today, to make a film about Ireland, go to Ireland. But that wasn't so commonplace back then. In the 1930s, studios almost never went to real-life locations. They built them in their own backyard. Even when John Ford made How Green Was My Valley in 1941, an entire Welsh village was constructed in Malibu, California. It was only after the end of World War II that Hollywood began to embrace a new realism by sending stars and filmmakers overseas. Ford's decision to travel for this film was right. After all, how could you ever match the green of Ireland anywhere else in the world? That and the prospect of returning to his ancestral homeland made this journey a must for Ford and a treat for his troop, many of whom were Irish Americans. But it was also a challenge. Huge Technicolor cameras and a special staff to maintain them were brought in from London, borrowed from other British studios. Research was done to determine how likely it would be for those cameras to shoot in sunshine and how late that sun would shine during the summer months. Then there were itineraries to be planned for cast and crew. Irish-born actor Arthur Shields brought along his sister. Maureen O'Hara traveled with her newborn baby and a nurse. And Ward Bond, busy completing another picture, would have to join the rest of the company at a later date. A master schedule was worked out to determine exactly which scenes would be filmed on location and which could be saved and shot later on when the troupe returned to Hollywood. Since it was summer when the Quiet Man Company left for Ireland, John Wayne decided to bring all four of his children with him. His oldest son, Michael, and oldest daughter, Tony, were both in their teens at the time and have particularly vivid memories of the experience. We've lived in California all our lives with palm trees and, you know, all of a sudden there's a huge castle there, there's a great big river there, and it was absolutely fabulous. It didn't have a lot of the modern conveniences. My father had a bathroom, uh, Uncle Jack had a bathroom, I think Maureen had a bathroom. And, but the rest of the crew and everybody, you know, we had to share like this one big bathroom area and one big shower area. And so we learned very fast that uh, if we wanted to get up in the morning and take a shower, that uh, we should not go in there early because it wouldn't do to have the crew waiting for us to get out of the shower room. You know? Kong, which was the small town near Ashford Castle where the film was shot, the town where the film was shot, Kong got electricity while we were there. This was in 1951. Now remember they had the, the lights on the wires, you know, uh, all around the, the, the kind of the, the, the town square. And uh, people were dancing and people were very, very happy. Then they found out that they had to pay for this electricity. They said, well, hey, we don't need it. You know, get rid of it. And they really said, we, we really don't need the electricity. Uh, Ashford Castle had its own generator, but people did not have electricity, and this was 1951. What Ireland and the little village of Conn may have lacked in amenities, it made up for in charm. The townspeople were delighted to have a movie company in their midst, particularly this Irish-American troupe, which mingled easily with the locals and won their hearts at every turn. 
The local newspaper, the Connaught Tribune, kept readers apprised of the Hollywood invasion and the visitors' colorful doings. From prop man Ace Holmes' search for an old-fashioned wooden four-poster bed to Ward Bond's weekend fishing exploits. Ford had already cast members of Dublin's Abbey Theater in key supporting roles, but he also called on the townspeople to add local color and a crowd to watch the climactic brawl between John Wayne and Victor McLaglen. Though if you look carefully, you'd also spot some ringers. The station master was played by John Wayne's makeup man, Webb Overlander. And wait, in this crowd shot, isn't that one of John Wayne's kids? Uncle Jack decided that he was going to use us in the film. And I think actually what he wanted was Pat, uh, yeah, Patrick and Melinda who are in the cart with Maureen. And then I think he thought, well, you know, these other two poor souls, they need to be in it too. So he, we all dressed up in costumes, and Michael and I are standing on either side of the cart, and Maureen is uh, in the cart with Patrick and Melinda, and they have lines and everything, you know. Will you not be putting up your bar, Mary Kay? Indeed I will not. No? No! Ford liked to surround himself with family when he was making a film. That was certainly true in the production of The Quiet Man. His son Patrick worked as an assistant, and his daughter Barbara served as an assistant editor on the picture. But there was another Ford in front of the camera. Francis Ford plays old Dan Tobin in The Quiet Man. He was a fixture in many of his brother's films, but this went far beyond nepotism. Back in the teens, Francis Ford was a star, the leading man in a great many films and popular serials. And it was he who led his much younger brother John, then known as Jack, into the movie business. Jack never forgot Francis's influence or his generosity. Ford's other brother, Eddie O'Ferna, was also on hand, working behind the scenes. And two of Maureen O'Hara's brothers appear in the film. One of them, James Lilburn, plays Father Paul. Charles Fitzsimons plays Forbes, and as a barrister or lawyer in real life, helped make arrangements for the company to shoot in Ireland. The Quiet Man also features two members of another distinguished Irish acting family. Barry Fitzgerald was by now a star, having received an Academy Award for his performance in Going My Way with Bing Crosby. Now he was returning to native soil, along with his brother, Arthur Shields, who'd also moved to Hollywood to work for Ford in The Plow and the Stars. Then there were the members of John Ford's extended family. Like John Wayne, Ward Bond had been a football player at the University of Southern California who caught the director's eye. He became one of Hollywood's busiest character actors and one of John Ford's favorites. Another longtime colleague of Ford's was the film's co-star, Victor McLaglen. They'd first worked together in 1928 and made many films in the years since. It was Ford who steered McLaglen to an Academy Award in 1935 for his compelling performance as Jippo Nolan, the Irish turncoat in The Informer. It really does give me great pleasure to present you this award for the best performance of 1935 in The Informer. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. I can hardly find words to express my gratitude and thanks for this. Actually, I want to thank everybody responsible for making this possible. Needless to say, I'm very happy and I want to thank you one and all. Now, more than 15 years later, McLaglen and Ford were teamed again with one significant change, the presence of Victor's son, Andrew McLaglen, as second assistant director. Oh, yeah. Well, see, first of all, I love the idea of being on this picture. Knowing my father was in it made it doubly great for me to go. Uh, I'd already become a first assistant, and, and there's only room for one first assistant on a picture, and that was Wingate Smith, uh, John Ford's brother-in-law. So but they said, look, Andy, you go as a second, and you know, you make your own way when you get there, which I did, and, and Wingate was, uh, I'll use the word gracious, I mean, he wasn't trying to set any records, uh, he stood by and let me do most of the job, which was very was good for me because I was a very eager assistant. Ford was known to be crafty and often cantankerous. McLaglen says he got along fine with the director, but he quickly learned he'd have to be on his toes. Funny story, I mean, the first day of shooting on the, uh, on the picture when we got there, Ashford Castle, it's all new to us, and we're all eager and we're waiting the first day, and the one thing Ford says, he said, have all the actors on the set. And we didn't even say, yeah, but, what if, or anything, because we knew if he said it, he meant it, except for Francis Ford, because uh, the production manager, Lukather, and I, uh, and Wingate, that we decided that there's no way, there'd be no way that he would be working in that first day, right around Ashford Castle and on the golf course. Ford walks on the set, puffing his pie, 
sits down. We're kind of waiting for the first word. Okay, Frank will be in the first shot. He looked around, saw that Frank wasn't there, and thought he'd give us a little bit of trouble, which he did. We had to lay a whole white beard on him quicker than it had ever been laid before, you know, like in 10 minutes. And by the time the camera was set up, Frank was in the first shot. McLaglan also learned right away what Ford could put his actors through and what kind of stuff Maureen O'Hara was made of. It was one of the first things she shot, and one of the first I asked Ford whether I should move some of the uh, sheep dung off the uh, because I noticed what was happening in the rehearsal. I said, Jack, don't you want to move some of that sheep dung? I mean, it was the field was covered. Leave it there, he said. So <laughs> Ford, uh, Ford really dragged uh, Maureen through a lot of it. I'm sure she was a little bit black and blue, but that was very real. <laughs> 